uh, Africa has been watching these negotiations quite closely. And let's discuss uh, the implications of some of those decisions on the continent. We're joined by Enoch Chikaba now. He's an interim director for agricultural development at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Great to have you with us uh, on the show, sir. Now, of course, Africa uh, relies heavily on its agricultural sector. Uh, and two especially worrying predictions uh, are that areas currently providing about 70 percent of the total value of crop production in sub-Saharan Africa will come from areas where heat stress uh, is at severe levels. Also, uh, nearly all African nations are expected to reach that two degrees uh, a warmer level between 2025 uh, and 2040. So, sir, if we stay on that path, how then will this affect the average yields of crop staples such as cassava, maize uh, and wheat on the continent? I mean, just to um, let you know that we are already living in a one degree warmer world. And just at one degree, we are already getting the frequency of droughts is increasing. We are getting more floods. And then I'm sure in Africa, you have been hearing of the uh, four armyworm locusts. So pest diseases are actually increasing right now. And looking into the uh, uh, 1.5 degree warmer world, if we don't do much to reduce that. And then, of course, to your other point, uh, to the two degree warmer world. If that prediction uh, yields will go down, I think, for, for rice, for maize, uh, by almost close to 20%. And that's a big deal. And then there will be also a, a lot of impact to livestock particularly on the heat. Uh, it will become uh, very hot that people can go out into the fields. You know, again, this is what we are getting from the, uh, you know, from the projections. So it is going to be very devastating uh, impact across the continent. If you then look at the most uh, recent research, is that the, uh, the impact of this crisis are not in the future. They are already a reality today uh, the most recent research says that in the past 60 years, uh, the, uh, the cut on the output production due to climate change globally uh, is uh, 21 percent. Again, these global numbers, they mask some of the regional realities. You take that same period, 60 years uh, in Africa, the production has been cut by 40 percent. So it doubles when you get to places like Africa, which are again closer to the equator. It is getting, uh, you know, water. It is also becoming a lot drier. Mind you, uh, the impact are much worse for those who depend on, on, on rainfall for their production. And I'm sure you know that uh, the irrigation infrastructure investment in Africa is less than 10% which means close to 90% of the current production is all rain fed. So that's why it is really, really urgent that we get a more adaptation, a climate smart uh, innovations uh, being focused on uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Mm. Well, it is interesting that as important as the agriculture sector is to the continent, <coughs> excuse me, the sector uh, does account for the bulk of emissions uh, in some economies on the continent. But as important uh, as it is to reduce those emissions, what are adaptation efforts, uh, why rather are adapt adaptation efforts uh, considered more crucial for the continent? Uh, and just adding in that currently roughly 75% of climate financing goes to mitigation uh, rather than adaptation. What's, what are your insights on that? Uh, again, I mean, you've seen that, uh, you know, at COP26, we were trying so hard to explain why it is important to focus on adaptation without, of course, neglecting the mitigation, which is reducing the emissions for the long term. But adaptation is where we should be focusing because we need to reduce the impact which is already taking place right now. And you find that this narrative is not uh, commonly shared across because of the realities of how important smallholder agriculture is globally. When you compare that in, in, um, in the US yeah, and you are in Europe, 
you find that the people employed in agriculture more directly is only less than two percent in africa it is more than 50 percent and those economies in europe and the u.s they are not powered by agriculture anymore it is the other sectors that are driving the economy again you find that in the u.s less than five percent of the gdp is from agriculture you go to europe is less than one percent in africa it is more than 30 percent so again agriculture in africa it's not just about food security. It's not just about uh, you know producing food. It is also linked to the economic growth, economic prosperity. And I think for the most people who grew up on a small order farm like myself, you know that you need to make agriculture work because it is a job. That is the only job which people have. Mm. You look at it now, building back you know from the COVID. All the efforts should be on smallholder agriculture because that's the bulk of where the people are and it is the way out of extreme poverty and into propelling those economies you know uh, into wealth creation and the economic growth mm. well on that note uh, mr chikava how then do you feel about uh, that final cop 26 draft agreement and those negotiations uh, it is said to be softer compared to the first they do they did say that though that uh, calls for the world's richest nations to provide more money uh, uh, to african nations to developing nations did strengthen but in case that doesn't bear fruit, what adaptation strategies uh, could sub-Saharan economies uh, look to uh, in terms of funds given uh, given to their current resource uh, due to their current resource constraints? What are your thoughts? In the COP26, I'm sure you've heard that uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation has committed $315 million to be funding the global research uh, called the CG system. Uh, and again, here is a global research organization, which is made up of uh, really state of the art, uh, 15 agricultural research stations, you know, across, across the world, uh, which again, is, it is in 108 countries, uh, including I think all the 49 countries are part of that. So we believe that the CG uh, system is well positioned to be developing climate smart um, you know tools for smallholder farmers like you know drought tolerant uh, crop varieties in maize in rice in cassava in millet in cowpea all those crops that are important for food security uh, but also for for profitability of the smallholder farmers so on our part, we are joined also by other organizations. I'm sure you had the USID also joined there, uh, you know, announcing again uh, with others a total of uh, $575 million in the next, uh, uh, you know, uh, three years. But that is not enough. Today, this global machine is funded to close to a billion dollars per year in a research it points out that it needs to become a $2 billion uh, a dollar per year uh, system uh, for them to adequately address all these adaptation needs for the smallholder farmers. So, so we are hoping uh, many other uh, donors and countries will be joining uh, you know, on that specific uh, you know, mission of making sure that, again, all these tools in crops, in livestock, in, in early warning systems, in uh, digital extension, so that all the information now regarding all the newer varieties can reach to the farmers uh, you know, fastest possible. I'm sure you all know that extension is a big challenge you know, today. Mm. Not so many countries have the foot soldiers on the ground. Uh, you go across the whole continent, you find that one extension officer in Nigeria, for example, is, is responsible for 10,000 farmers. You go to Uganda, you know, one extension officer, 5,000 farmers. We need new tools. And I think digital will then open up. So there are a lot of, uh, a lot of those tools uh, which are classified as a climate smart, you mm. know, tools and products which will be helping the smallholder farmers.